<laughs> Great. So we'll go ahead and get started. I just want to make a quick introduction, say a few things, and then we're going to turn the floor over to Andy, of course, that's why we're all here to hear um, all about nutrients and managing them well. So um, my name's Allie Nichols. I'm a planner here at the Pierce Conservation District. And um, thanks for coming tonight. We're happy that you're all here. And um, I'd like to just thank Andy for taking the time to come and talk to us tonight, share his expertise. It's one thing to have all his great publications on your shelf, but this is a great chance for us to interact with you personally and um, wrestle together with some of these concepts in the context of our own farms. So Andy's super busy, so don't take it for granted that he said he would do this for us. <laughs> so thank you, Andy. Um, we're also really thankful for the King CD, and they're making this uh, workshop available remotely. So probably we, are, we had about 30 people signing up all the way even from Alaska tonight. So um, thank you, King CD, for making it possible for more people to join. Um, and just the last thing I wanted to draw your attention to was we have our farm team flyer here. A lot of you are already familiar with our programs, but go ahead and pick up one of these flyers and you can just get a, a brief overview of all the things that we can do here with you on your farms. Um, you know, we've got um, all the equipment that we have to, that you can borrow from us. Uh, we also have the information around our farm visits and site um, in consultation we can do on your farm. And um, we also have a listing of all our workshops on the back. And we also do, we have a couple options for cost share for different natural resource projects on your farm. So if you're interested in, in partnering with us on those types of things, there's a, a nice list of the different projects that we often cost share around. So go ahead and pick up one of those flyers if you're interested in talking more with us. So at this point, I just want to turn it over to Andy. Oh, okay. I guess I'm breaking up a little bit remotely. Yeah. Um, you, I'm not sure what that's on your side, so I'm not sure how to fix that. I think I'm unmute. I'm definitely unmuted. Yeah, but the quality isn't good is what I'm hearing. So, oh, okay. yeah, I can hear you, but others cannot. Um, and I'm not sure why. Um, it's probably on your side, so. Should we just go okay. ahead? And well, yeah, why don't you go ahead? It, it, looks like, um, it looks like others can hear you, so it might be on that person's side. So, great. Go All ahead. Right. Sorry. Oh, yes. Right. So, um, any questions that come out from the remote audience, um, we're going to have Robin monitor those as they come in, and then she'll just repeat them for us. So, that's the plan. And then uh, we'll also be trying to chat back to the remote folks any interesting information in the conversation from here. So, all right. Good evening. Uh, let's see if we can get electrons to further. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate being here. I'm Andy Berry. I'm a soil scientist with Washington State University. I have uh, been there for about 30 something years. So I've been around a long, long time. I do a lot of work with organic nutrient management, uh, small farm management, uh, composting, compost usage, uh, biosolids management, and just a whole, whole raft of things. Today I'm going to talk generally about nutrient management going to jump around a little bit from different things, going to have some PowerPoint uh, presentation, and then there's a, a calculator that's developed to help uh, deal with application rates for nutrients for different crop systems, which we're going to go into a little bit, and I'll talk a little bit more about soil testing, and then we have some actual soil tests that I can go over and sort of talk about what I think these 
these mean and if anybody else has brought some we can we can deal deal with those anybody bring soil tests yeah, okay great we'll deal with those when we get there okay. so andy let me just say can i say something really quickly um and and at, tell robin that she should be telling you these things but you're cut off you need to um change the video around a little bit like um yeah there we go or just move or move the top of the laptop i can't see the screen though yeah and then and then secondly so just move the laptop a little yeah there we go and then secondly um oh the presentation is turning up in Good. presentation mode on so the way it was set up before was working and now it's back to on presentation mode is what we see on the remote side something like presentation robin buckingham changed it around earlier to what it should be i think we're doing it we're trying no nope. no nope. because what i see on my side which is what everybody else sees is the uh is presentation side unless robin has it yeah there we go perfect oh which one do i, I yeah there. there we go okay are we set there now gwen yeah excellent <laughs> we'll go ahead and get started uh, Maybe we'll get started. Uh, here we go. So um, generally what I'm going to talk about today is the calculator, which is a spreadsheet that's used to help determine application rates of organic fertilizers or commercial and uh, non-organic fertilizers, compost, cover crops, and help you know how much nutrients are in those so you can use it for determining how, mu how much to put on and do you need more depending on what you're, what you're doing. Um, it's generally simple, it's in a spreadsheet, it's fairly easy, and it uh, also will uh, calculate different costs. If you know the cost of your material, the cost of your seeding rates, cost your, of your tractor usage, you, it can calculate the uh, cost effectiveness of, of the different materials. I like using it for comparing different costs of, if you have two different fertilizers, like a blood meal fertilizer versus a feather meal fertilizer, you compare the cost of the two for pounds of N, and then that'll help you determine which ones you ought to go with. And also it calculates a replacement value for, for cover crops to give you a, how much N are you getting from that cover crop. Uh, one thing I forgot, I know we have people from uh, all over Western Washington, Eastern Washington, Alaska, and other places. Most of the comments I'm gonna make are, per, are particular to Western Washington and I'll try to remember to make the appropriate comments for things that differ from e Eastern Washington. Okay, so the calculator was originally originated through Oregon State University. It used a number of research projects, one that I was involved in, which we're gonna talk a little bit about tonight, and then some others that went on in Oregon. And it was uh, used and um, using in other regions. Uh, this is on a trial basis. We don't know exactly how well it works because it was really developed for uh, Western Washington and Western, Western Oregon, as the climates are very similar and the temperatures are, are similar. Where does the calculator fit into a button nutrient budgeting practice? Because everybody has some sort of budgeting method that they use for determining how much, how much fertilizer they put on, how much compost you put on, uh, what kind of cover crops you're gonna, gonna use, what kind of nitrogen values do you think you're gonna get after you've uh, used a cover crop. So we'll go through some of the steps. One is you need to predict the crop need or crop uptake for, for the different crops. And I've got a nice little table uh, further in that tells about that. You have to estimate soil nitrogen in absence of new inputs or baseline or base, basically the baseline uh, nit nitrogen mineralization. That comes from the inherent organic, organic matter in the, in the soil, which, which can be important depending on how much organic matter you have. If you're irrigating, you may need, and you have nitrogen in your irrigation water, and you need to know how much and you're getting from irrigation water if that's an important source of uh, nitrogen or water for, for what you're getting. Um, hopefully you don't have nitrogen in your irrigation water because that's a way better thing from a water quality standpoint. And then you need to estimate the inputs that are required and this is where the calculator comes in. This is what's required for different fertilizer inputs. So this would be 
from organic fertilizers, uh, cover crops or other things like that. And these are things that mineralize very rapid, things like chicken manure and such not. Um, monitor soil nitrate. Um, the question becomes when you're putting organic material on in your organic producer, eventually you get enough organic material in, your, in, in the system that you get inherently more, more, more nitrogen mineralizing. So you need to be able to account, account for that. And also you need to account for in the fall, if you take a soil test, you can determine if you have more nitrogen in the system at the end of the year, that you're basically in Western Washington, you have excess nitrogen at the end of the growing season. The rains come and it's going to get washed in, in into the groundwater. It's not going to stay in stay in the soil. So it's really important to figure out are you in that category that you're uh, putting on excess nitrogen or you're putting on just the right amount of nitrogen for your crop. And then that's the just just for next year. It's always a reactive process for for looking at what you did this year. You can have a, a soil test that you take in the fall. Look at how much nitrogen is left in your profile. If it's high, then next year you want to you want to adjust by putting on something a little a little less. So this is just a reminder of the uh, nitrogen cycle. Um, I'm going to wander away from this because I need to point, and we'll see how that works for the microphone. It doesn't work with the microphone. We can't hear you. Andy, we can't hear you. Sorry, we just went over the nitrogen cycle and I have to go over and point. I can't resist. I'm sorry. Andy, you can use your pointer on your screen. Oh. Good question was, yes. Not much. Not much. It's not one we re really worry about. Okay, so the pointer doesn't work, so I can't use the pointer. Uh, no, because we're in, we're in uh, thing. I'll just try and I, I know that I need to be stuck to this, so I'll try not to wander away. Okay, the other thing to keep in mind when you're using organic amendments, either from chicken manure, cover crops, organic fertilizer, they have, uh, basically they go from organic nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen, sorry, organic nitrogen, ammonium nitrogen, and the nitrate nitrogen. And when you put these on, you get, um, in year one, you get a portion that's nitrate nitrogen, a portion that's organic nitrogen. Nitrate nitrogen is available the first year. The organic nitrogen, you get not only some the first year, but you get some the second year. And this is when I wish I had them. No. Oh, maybe. Oh, there you go. Okay. Oh, well, you the ones from here. So, okay. So, where do we go? To, okay, there we go. It disappears. Okay. Um, so, in year one, you put on material, you have uh, organic nitrogen, you have the portion of it that's plant available. And so the plant available use the first year. The organic nitrogen, you get mineralized, just not the first year nitrogen, but you'll get additional nitrogen the second year. So you'll, so you'll get, let's say you're dealing with a, a chicken manure. Chicken manure, you may get 30 to 75% of the available of the organic matter the first year. The second year, you'll probably get more like 8% of the total nitrogen, organic nitrogen in, in the soil available the second year. And then that goes down as, as years go by, it gets down to about 2% after about uh, four or five years. And so it becomes additive that year, what you get from whatever, you're, whatever material you're applying this year, you get this year's material, plus you get some material from last year and the year before that and the year before that. Well, surprisingly, if you put on agronomic rates for a number of years, you get to the point where you have too much fairly quickly, within 10 to 15 years, you're getting, you're getting enough payback that you may not need to add that much uh, 
fertilizer. So it really, it really behooves you to, uh, to figure how much, figure how much you're getting, and sort of keep track of that. And and that soil test that we do in the fall will help you sort of get get to that point. Um, the calculator uses uh, looks at decomp decomposition rate, nutrient release of uh, various products, and we have. Uh, sort of a quality, a quality stable as here, where the top of the triangle has sugars and proteins. These uh, the decompose and become available quite quickly. Then as we go down the triangle, hemicellulose and cellulose, which are cell cell uh, wall pieces and cell 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 pieces just in general, are less available than the sugars and proteins. And lignin, which is definitely cell wall material, is is available even less 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 for the period. So really what you're suiting for if you want really quick, quick, quickly release nutrient, nitrogen, you want to have materials that have sugar and protein in it or, or a high nitrogen content. So this is sort of the philosophy behind using the calculator. Um, it basically looks at end mineralization rate of new inputs, which is controlled through the quality of the input, which we just went over. And a quality could be another way of saying uh, C to N ratio or nitrogen ratio. Um, a lot of people think uh, C to N ratio, the calculator uses nitrogen to do all its calculations on it because that's what becomes quickly available. One of the reasons is carbon content in most organic things is relatively stable, somewhere between 35 and 45%. Um, it's pretty standard for any kind of organic carbon in any sort of organic uh, organic fertilizer, manure, or cover crop, where the nitrogen uh, ranges from 0.5 to 12 percent, which makes a huge difference in nitrogen availability. Comparing a composted dairy manure, which has a C to N ratio usually of about one, no, sorry, not C to N ratio, an N, N rate, an N content of about one percent, where chicken manure has an N content of three to four percent. So a huge, hugely difference in, in how, how, the, how they're available. Chick manure, chick manure comes available very quickly where, where uh, dairy manure would become, solids would become available much, much, much slower. Okay, so this is just went over some of the equations that are used in the calculator. And I said that it's calculated all on the total N analysis on a dry weight basis because we, because manure comes in all sorts of forms of wet relationship. It could be very wet, soupy, nasty looking stuff to, to dry stuff. So all the calculations are done on a dry weight, dry weight basis that, that'll help you determine that you're, you're applying fertilizer or nitrogen rather than a, uh, a water, water source. And it calculates uh, estimated plant available end from the materials and it gives you a four week number and a 10 week number. 10 week number is equivalent to the full, full, season, avail full season availability. And some materials become available much quicker than others. So we generally have uh, three sort of types of uh, material that the calculator looks at. We have uh, organic fertilizers or fresh material, which would be fresh manure, uh, seed meals, fish meals, blood meals, things, things like that. And then we have cover crops, which is in a class of their own. And then compost, which has much more stable, stable organic, organic material. And they're each handled a little bit differently in, in behind the scenes in the calculator where all the calculations are made. So this is just a note to, to remind me is that uh, the calculator predicts pans for this current season's input. It doesn't predict pans for mineralized from pre-existing soil, uh, soil amounts. That's usually taken care of within extension bulletin. It's taken care of with which in, in the uh, calculator that you have a certain amount of N that you get from organic matter. And this is somewhere between uh, two and 5% organic matter soil. If you're outside that range, then you may wanna deal with it. But the extension bulletins, uh, this calculator uh, takes that into account so it's not an additional, uh, additional input that you need, need to make. Here's just a, what the calculator looks like. There's a number of spreadsheets that, that go with it. We'll go over this to, in some detail in a little bit. I just want to give you a, a first-hand look. It really helps you calculate how much 
fertilizer and the difference of cost and how much how much you need. Um, there's there is the uh, URL if you need it. It's free. It comes in English units. The nice thing about it, if you go in and just search out um, Oregon State cover crop calculator, this will come up and you and you can go to it because they've they've been moving the website around a little a little bit. This is the the, the, the last available. They're in the process of redoing the calculator, so within six months they'll be there'll be a little bit new ones. You you probably won't see any difference because all, all, everything happens behind the scenes. There's two versions of it. One that is in pounds per acre, and another one that's in pounds per thousand square feet. So depending on how you think, will depend on which one you you want to use. Uh, I I think in pounds per acre, so we're going to talk about pounds per acre today. Well, so, so there was a number of research studies that were used to put into to to for the calculator to work, and I'm going to go over some one of the research studies that was done here in Puyallup and uh, down in the Willamette Valley comparing uh, manures and composts, and that's the nitrogen from uh, what we refer to as Gale et al. It was a graduate student down at o OSU that took this on as his thesis, and it's been a very very popular uh, article. Here's some of the materials we looked at. We have broiler litter, dairy solids, uh, dairy solids compost, other composts. Um, we had um, broiler litter compost, and we had rabbit manure compost. Probably the only ones who've ever done any work with rabbit manure. And then we had uh, some yard waste compost, and we had some specialty products, which we related to zoos, organic fertilizers. So they have a, a higher C down. And here we have. Um, you can see that on this, we have three different color bars, organic N, ammonium N, and nitrate N. You notice that these compost or uh, specialty products or, or, or raw manure really have no nitrate in them. They have no plant available nitrate in them because it has to mineralize, it has to take time. The process that it goes on in a compost pile is very similar to what you see in the soil. But you do see that you do have some ammonium available, particularly for the chicken manure, it's high in ammonium. And some of the other ones have much less. That is definitely becomes plant available the very, very first year. So here's a, a combination of this study. The way they did it is we looked at a laboratory incubation where we took the different different uh, materials we were working with, the compost, raw manure, took them, mixed them in with soil, put them in a controlled temperature area, and let them mineralize, and then measured uh, nitrate it periods of time over, over over the life of it. And we went up to 70 days, which is equivalent to 10 weeks or, or full season, full season mineralization. And we compared that directly to some full season plant available nitrogen numbers we took growing uh, sweet corn, because sweet corn's used frequently for nitrogen availability. It uses a lot of nitrogen. It's a good, it's a good, good, good crop for, for determining nitrogen availability. And you can see that we have a one-to-one -one line there. It looks really good. But the laboratory uh, analysis looks just just like the uh, field field uh, availability. So that's really a, a good thing because then when you have a new material, you can just use the laboratory analysis rather than having to wait figuring out how much this is used used in the field. So we're going to go over a couple of different materials here. We have. Uh, uh, we have a number of slides here, and on the left we have uh, decomposition or the, just the breakdown of it, which goes on fairly quickly, which is the carbon fraction of it. And then on the right-hand side we have the plant available nitrogen. This one happens to be from broiler litter. You can see that full season here we're getting from this material is about 40 percent. And this was a... Uh, Okay, so this broiler litter was about 4% N. So we're getting about 40%, 40% 40, 40 of the total nitrogen in the, uh, in, 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 in the manure compost becomes a, a bowel, a, this is broiler litter, so it's not compost, broiler litter the first year. As compared to, here's fresh dairy solids and composted dairy solids. Again, we have decomposition on the left and then a plant available nitrogen graph on the, Right, you can see that the green is the compost, the red is the fresh, and the point to, to have here, although we still have a fair amount of decomposition, we're not getting much nitrogen availability from this material. You can see that it actually goes negative early in the season, then doesn't become positive till later in the season, and that's for the dairy solids. 
the dairy compost puts out a little bit of nitrogen pretty much all season. Question? Separated solids. Oh, I need to replace. The question was, what kind of dairy manure was it? Liquid, solid, or such not? And it's separated solids, so the liquids have been removed, and it's just, just the, the solid fraction of it. Um, although it doesn't, doesn't supply a lot of nitrogen right off the bat, it does supply a long-term form of slow-release nitrogen. The second year, you still still get some out of there, and, and you're adding carbon carbon to the soil. So, so there's still a number of good a number of good things you can get out of it. Just it's not not may not be the best for your nitrogen uh, dynamics. And then here we have uh, specialty products. So these would be custom fertilizers, uh, feather meal, blood meal, uh, chicken chicken manure pellets things like that, uh, grain, ca uh, canola meal, uh, thing, things like that. You can see that we get pretty good recovery, 40 to 60% recovery from, from the different, different, especially products. That's why they're an organic fertilizer because you're getting a fair amount of nitrogen fairly quickly. And then we have other compost down at the bottom. You can see it looks like we're getting five to 10% of the available nitrogen from all, all, all of the different other composts that we have either. Uh, the yard waste compost, rabbit manure compost, chicken manure compost. There's a particular thing about chicken manure compost. When you have compost and you're composting it, when it's fully mature, you shouldn't have an ammonia smell to it. And I've never met a chicken manure compost that doesn't have an ammonium smell to it. So when we get to the calculator, it's handled, even though chicken manure compost is a compost, we handle it more as a fresh material because of the amount of ammonium in it. It just doesn't react like other, other composts. We need, need to keep, keep, keep that in mind. Because even with this study, there's a lot of uh, aging of manure that goes on that is said, said to be compost. So here's uh, just another one that shows uh, plant available nitrogen on the left-hand axis and on the bottom axis, the uh, total amount of N in the uh, material and we have the different different materials there. You can see the specialty products, which are organic fertilizers have the most that in them. And the uh, dairy, dairy solids have, have, have the le least amount of them and everything else falls somewhere in between. Okay, so this just shows the uh, calculated of the predi predicted full season for and of the 28 days of the specialty products are included here. You can see that most of the specialty products all are up in the, uh, the upper portion of the flat line where you're getting uh, you know, about a 60% availability from any, any of the different uh, specialty uh, materials. Okay, so that sort of takes care of the uh, organic, um, organic composts and other materials. We're gonna go a little bit into the cover crop portion of this and basically why, what you have to do if you're using the calculator to determine how much nitrogen you might get from your cover crops, you have to take, you have to build a ring, which can be any size, and usually we use one by one or two by two. You put it on the ground, you harvest what's underneath it, you then chop that up so you can mix it on up and get a nice sample. You take and send a sample off to the lab and you have it analyzed for total N and moisture content. And knowing the total end and moisture content, you can calculate availability of nitrogen from, from that material. I just got a couple of slides here. This just shows, shows the sort of the harvesting of the cover crop and what you're sort of left with when you're done. You have a little square with everything in a bag. Then you take it and you chop it on up and you, you don't send them the whole sample, but you can send them a portion of the sample. No lab wants to receive a, a, a 30 gallon garbage can of material. They want just a smaller smaller sample, but they'll take that smaller sample. That's why you have to take that sample, the big sample, the 30 gallon sample and chop it up in all sorts of pieces, smaller pieces so you can get it, get a re representative sample because depending on what you're growing for cover crops, um, you wanna make sure it's representative. If you're growing a mixture, you wanna make sure that what you're sampling contains whatever the field looks like. If you, if you don't bring a good, good sample in that's representative of what's in the field, you don't get, get good numbers. Okay, so this is just a comparison of some of the different uh, materials we have, different uh, things that go on with the calculator. We have the three different groups, the fresh organic material, cover crop residues, and then finished compost. 
And uh, you can see that the C to N ratio uh, ranges for all these fairly wide, which is why they're, uh, you want to use a calculator for using predicting predicting these. It's just too hard to do to do by by hand otherwise. This is just a, a, a table. There's a number of these tables around. This is just one of the ones that the uh, calculator uses, and it has the total amount of N and in a C to N ratio, plan available uh, availability from four weeks and then from 20, 10, 10 weeks at the uh, end. Um, the nice thing about this is if the material you're using isn't on the calculator list and you have it, you can have it analyzed or ask where you're buying it from, what's the an analysis is, put it into the sheet and then they, you can use that to calculate your nitrogen availability. So here's one table. There are many tables out there used for how much plant available nitrogen is required to grow at different crops. I, it's sort of broken down into three different groups, low, medium, and high. High using more nitrogen than, than the other ones, lower, lower as yes. Some of the, some of the lower ones are uh, legumes, so they produce their, their own uh, end, but some of them not. It just sort of depends on, on how they are. And it also has, you notice there's two different columns, one for an organic transition, and then one for an established or organic farm. If you've already been in business for a number of years, been adding compost, adding cover crops, that's gonna increase the amount of uh, carbon in your soil or how much organic matter you have in your soil. So you need to credit, credit for that. And that's sort of how they, they deal with that, is we have two different columns. You can see that in the first one, if you're just in transition, newly organic, you know, the range for low would be 60 to 100 pounds of N needed to raise that crop, where for establish, Establish one somewhere less than than 50. So it really pays that once you've been in business for a while to keep track of where all your nitrogen is going, because um, you may start out where you need some, and as time goes on, you need less and less and less if you're running a good program using cover crops and 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 compost. Okay, so we have a couple of graphs here just sort of show you some difference, and I'm tied to this, which is frustrating just for me because I like to wander. Uh, this is plant available stuff for the calculator, and this is the uh, fresh material. Got stuff over it. I can't see. I'm I'm pretty sure this is the. Hold on a minute. Yeah. Well, it's fresh, fresh organic. It has a ten week and uh, four week. And uh, you can see that on a number of these, we have it in two different manners, a percent of total N or a pound, pound of N per dry ton. So if you're, if you're doing, doing that, depending on which way you wanna do your calculation, you can get, get the number. You can see that for most of these, if you're down at 1% uh, uh, total N in your, in your uh, material from uh, uh, fertilizer or something like that, you're not getting much in. You're actually going the negative means you're tying up nitrogen in your soil, so it won't be there to, to, to do it. And this is where it would be uh, a raw a raw dairy dairy solids would end up down in that one percent range. You know, you don't start uh, providing N until you really get up to about the three percent, about a break even at two percent, and at three percent N in whatever material you're using, you get a fair. Uh, you start to get N, N available. Okay, which one is this? This is the cover crop one? Yep. Okay, so this is the cover crop one. So if you're using different cover crops, again, this is even more striking that at one you get, these go way more negative than the previous slide that you're tying up more, more nitrogen, 1%. And in a cover crop would be a rye cover crop that's already produced seed heads would be, that would be down in about a 1% N category. So you get that, if you're using rye, you tend to, tend to have have a tie up N right that first early in the season and then it'll, it'll start release N later in the season. And then as it gets, you know, if you get higher up to 4%, there's legume, you get a fair amount of, of N from cover crops. And then this leaves compost is the last one. Again, the four and 10 weeks uh, availability. You know, you can see a trend that runs through these until you get up to above 2%, you're really not much getting much N from your material uh, of available that, for, that first year or first year. Or this year. Com compost, um, if it has C to N in a moderate range, um, it, it'll, it'll certainly give you some 
once you get above 2%. Okay, so this is just another point that I wanted to make. Um, if you're using manures, composts, um, even organic fertilizers, if you're using a sort of a balanced material, you may get to the point, we're gonna cover this very late, late in the presentation, we're gonna go over some soil tests, that you have more phosphorus in your soil than you need. And the question is, how do I, how do I manage this within the calculator? What you want to do is pick materials that have that are low in phosphorus. So there's a number uh, num number of these that, that are that we'll go over when we get to the to the spreadsheet. That's how you can use these. Or you or switch if your phosphorus numbers become too high, you can uh, switch to using cover crops uh, as your nutrient source. Use a legume that that provides uh, nitrogen, but but you don't have the input of the the uh, uh, phosphorus. There's more and more, more and more farms I've seen are getting getting into that category. It doesn't really matter if they're organic or not. It's just, just people aren't watching their numbers and where they're going. Okay, so this is just uh, a review that fresh organic uh, ends are controlled by C to N ratio or N N N release. Uh, total N is a reliable index of C to N ratio. There's a number of things that I think about. I usually think about C to N ratio when I think about availability. I know this uses N, so in my mind, I know that where 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 these sort of go and where they're where they're important. And that uh, we cover looking at four weeks and ten weeks. And that composts are good for soil building, but they're a little expensive if you're going to look at plant available N. If you have, unless you can find a compost that has, you know, an N content over two percent, there you're not going to get much nitrogen from the first year. But they will give you a fair amount of carbon, which is good, and we'll go to, to soil building just, just in general. And too much soil building can lead to, to plant available nitrogen overload that basically you get to a point that you have too much organic, organic nitrogen in the soil, it all mineralizes too quickly. You're creating more, your soil creates more nitrogen than you need uh, to begin with. Okay, so we've sort of talked about how the calculator works. I have, I want to delve sort of into a mid-season sampling because um, depending on how you're using your management system, you may want to uh, apply side dress some, some fertilizer mid-season or if you're second doing, if you have a, a small first crop, you have a second crop and you want to replant, what should you do? Should you put down nitrogen or not? The way you tell it is, 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 is you test, test the soil, see how much nitrogen is in the soil, to determine if you can side dress. And then this gives you, over on the very far left-hand column, talks about soil, soil nitrate. That's the mid-season test, sometimes referred to as a pre-side dress nitrate test. It's used, used a lot in corn for corn production. I like using it because it tells me how much N is available mid-season. Have I applied enough? And if I'm gonna double crop, do I have enough in there for a second crop without even adding anything? Because if your numbers are high enough, in, in midsummer and you're growing a crop that's a short season crop or, or is a low user of nitrogen, you might get, get away without putting on more, more nitrogen. So you can see that this is for, for a mid season, you can see we have across the top squash, sweet corn and broccoli. Broccoli is a high need, squash is a low need. And you can see that if we get a, C, uh, a PSNT, so that's how much nitrate is in the, in the, in the soil mid season, 20 to 30, we need a little bit of nitrogen, but if we're up in that 30 to 40 or 40 or above range, we need no nitrogen for most, for all, for all cropping sequences. So that's something to think about that. If you're growing something and you're harvesting it mid season, do I really need to add more fertilizer? And, and doing a soil test will help you make, make that determination. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about phosphorus, nitrogen. We're going to talk a little bit about phosphorus and potassium. We're going to wander back into nitrogen again because it's the number one crop, number one nutrient uh, in need for crop production. Um, we have on the left hand side, we have uh, phosphorus and it's the Bray P1 test, which is used in Western Washington. If you're in Eastern Washington, you use an Olson test and the numbers are a little bit different. These are for Western Washington. And they're ranged into low, medium, high, and excessive. And you can determine sort of when you want to put on more fertilizer. Yeah. 
is available electronically to these other places. The soil test interpretation guide, it's the one that looks like this, has soil test interpretation in it. That's where these come from. I use this a lot. I use this when I get the soil testing values. And the nice thing about it is it has uh, tables in it that if it, ha if, if it says uh, what the concentration of phosphorus is, let's say you have a phosphorus concentration of uh, 40, and it says then for 40, the recommendation is somewhere between zero and 200 pounds. Oops, you have zero and 200 pounds. Zero would be for the 40. 200 pounds would be for a number reading 20, and then just get them get them to equal equal in the center someplace, and that work, works really well. It really pays to look at your Fair amount just gives you the different different ranges. You know, I if you're in, I, I usually don't worry about till you get down to about 150, uh, 200 to 150 before I start putting on phosphorus for a uh, potassium fertilizer. So those are numbers you also want to keep in mind. We're going to dig out some soil test uh, values, some soil test analysis later on, and we can we can do this. All these. Okay, so we talked about general soil sampling and we talked about PSNT, which is a uh, uh, mid-season soil test. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about post-harvest soil nitrate testing. This is sometimes referred to as report card testing. Because what you do is you take a one foot sample in the fall, you have it analyzed for nitrate. This was the sample, this procedure was set up for largely for corn growers and grass growers and, and dairymen who were over applying. And so this lets you know how much nitrogen you have at the end of the season. And then there's indices for determining if you have too much. And if you have too much, that means next year what you want to know is for whatever field you're monitoring that you may need to apply apply less because you're you're over you're over. So this just talks about what I just said. And uh, this sort of goes through and identifies uh, changes in timing or nutrient manure application. What you do is you do a composite 12 inch, uh, zero to 12 inch sample, 15 to 30 cores for, for your soil type. And you harvest this usually sometime in August or September. You want to do it before you get uh, five, inches, five inches of rain for sandy texture soil, sandy loams, such not, uh, uh, three inches of rain for little heavier soils. But you want to get it. You want to get this sampled before the rains start. Before you get to that point, because if you get to, let's say you didn't get them in, and you got seven inches of rain, that means you've moved. You already started to move nitrate through the profile, and you're going to have. You want to still use this test. You have to just not take the first foot, but you then have to take the second foot. So I really, I really strongly recommend that if you're going to use this testing, get it done before the uh, rains come in. And Okay, it's on the resource list, post-harvest soil nitrate testing for manure cropping systems west of the Cascades. A little different uh, things for east of the Cascades. And usually the tar target sampling dates is October 15th, sorry, August 15th, to October 15th, but I always watch, watch, watch the rain. Doesn't matter what the calendar says, if you're, if you're getting to, to five inches of rain you wanna go and you wanna use this, Test you want to go out there and sample. Yes. Yep. If you're applying uh, by Thanksgiving, you're too late. Um, 
But yeah, you do need to really watch how much you're applying and what the crop growth is and patterns are. There's a nice little program out of Whatcom County that sort of helps predict uh, risk valuation of, from manure uh, applications. And that's, that's what I would recommend for those because you really don't want to be applying late in the season. You know, you gotta, you gotta really watch that rain and when, when you have to decide to do it. If you're a dairy operator, you really need to manage your lagoon because sometime in the fall, you're gonna be done applying and you won't apply again till, well, depending on what February looks like, you might get some go on in February, certainly in, in March, but it's, it's a small amount. So it's, it, 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 it's, a prob it's problematic and it's hard. Okay, good question though. Any other questions while we're at a spot? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Well, you could certainly you can certainly take a soil sample now. For, I wouldn't bother doing nitrate because nitrate nitrate doesn't mean anything in Western Washington uh, this time of the year. It's not, it's going to be low, so don't bother paying for that analysis. But certainly for a basic type of analysis, now would be a fine time to do it. Uh, what you may want to do is get into sampling in the fall because then uh, you can do do the nitrate. You can do one 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 sample one sample testing rather than two sample testings. Um, but where you are now, you you, you may want to do do some now because you want to be able to make some some uh, decisions on what you're doing this first first year. But you don't necessarily have to do a basic sample every year, every two or three years, depending on how 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 intensively you're going to manage manage what you're doing would be sufficient for a basic sample. If you're looking at a, at a post-harvest nitrate test, that's usually done every year until you sort of get to the point where you sort of see how you're doing. What about tagro, anyway? Tagro is good stuff. It, it's uh, treated in human waste. Basically what, what it does, it goes into a uh, tagro at the plant, you flush the toilet, it goes down into the uh, stream, it goes to the treatment plant goes through dual digestion. So it'll go through an anaerobic stage and an aerobic stage. This gets to the highest class of this material. It's, it's safer, safer to use than raw manure because it's been, been treated. Pathogen levels are way, way low on it and it has an excellent nitrogen, uh, nitrogen source. So it's really, really good material. Okay, this just tells about uh, uh, what to do with, uh, this is the question for Amy, you know, if you have something between 20 and 45, 20, you're, you're getting to where you're getting too high with 45, you're got to make major changes in your management practices. Okay, so that is, these are just some of the references that uh, are over there or are available electronically. And, okay, so now we're going to go into what's the calculator. So if you want to stand up and stretch a little bit, now would be a time because it'll be a minute before I get this straightened out. Okay, you got to slap me upside the head. It's frozen. Oh, good. Oh, well, then I can, no, no, I can't wander because it's the, uh, Okay, so what I'm looking for, okay, this one. Uh, no. This is okay. Give them a couple of minutes and then we'll but if you're fine, we were fine in November. Well, 
Um, it shouldn't be. They need more acreage or a bigger lagoon. Or to something. I'm surprised uh, ecology hasn't gotten on to the Department of Ag. Hasn't gotten on. Uh, I don't know. I get phone calls regularly on. But they're not, not in this, not in this, they're from like up north. I don't get any, any calls from, no. We don't, we, I, we hardly have a, we don't have that many dairies left, unfortunately. You go from the Enum Clock Plateau, there's still some left there. Yeah. It's, uh, there's a reason I'm not a regulator. And there's a reason I'm not a regulator. I'm not a regulator. Sure. Yeah, so like, well, I mean, that's sort of like, um, <laughs> well, they're going to have different soil types. And that's what we can do. We're going to have different soil types. Well, first, it's a different type of soil types. Right. 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 Because soil is in a plant of the place. And if you're talking about the valley, uh, we'll talk about the gel valley. Because I mean, like, gel, fine thing, well, very nice soil. The bully has a couple of things run off. Uh, sandy, no rock. Very rough the gram areas. Sure, what happened to your video, but it sounds like it, it, it's on here. Yeah. <laughs> so we may or may not have video. I don't know. I don't see it. 
That's fine. That means I can wave and, or other things. Okay. So we're going to get going here. We'll give you, <coughs> we'll get going in two more minutes. Okay. So you can get yourself resettled again. Whispering in your ear. Hi, I think there's another. How do you make it? How do you make it what? View like it was before. You can't. Oh, okay. This is what you see. Okay. It's okay. different. It's, it's different. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get going here. Now it's been a couple of minutes. Um, so what I have up on the screen is the calculator. We're going to look at the calculator here for uh, a couple minutes. Are this is is this a? Uh, find out. No, it's not. Damn. Touch, it's not a touch screen. Okay, so the first page that I have open here is a fertilizer analysis. And you can see that on the left hand, left hand side, left hand side of the screen, we have various different uh, fertil organic fertilizers. And then on the uh, right side, you have sort of the calculations to go with it and the definitions. So what you're allowed to do is you're allowed to change the yellow cells, but you're not allowed to change the green cells. Well, if you can get through this, the, uh, the protection, you can do it. But you can see some of these have more information in them than others. It just depends on what they have from it. So if you're buying material that's not on the list or close to the list, um, you may wanna ask things. Ask people, then we have a synthetic fertilizer portion. And then, oops. And we also have the compost fra fraction down here for determining uh, fractions in it. Okay, and then the next tab here is the cover crop portion. And this tells you, this will give you the calculation of how much cover crops there are. And then this has, if you're dealing with cover crops and you have, know how much your seed is, you can uh, do some cost analysis of, of your seed. And then here's a cost analysis of the different, the different uh, fertilizers to how much, how much you're gonna use if you know how much the, uh, the cost is. And then this one here just tells you how much nutrients are, uh, how much are there for, uh, for cover crop field. So, so what you're gonna do is here's the, the uh, fertilizer page and you just look at blood meal and feather meal. These would be, these, these are somewhat equivalent if you are having phosphorus issues, if you have too much phosphorus in your soil, you might be using blood meal, but you can switch to something like feathers meal because blood meal has 12.5% uh, N, 1.5% P2O5 and 0.6% K2O, where the feather meal has 13% N and nothing, no phosphorus and no potassium. So that's sort of how you would wanna get through the phosphorus issue if you, if you have a site that has more phosphorus in it. But you can look down here for nutrients provided. So I was putting on 100 pounds of uh, feather meal or 100 pounds of blood meal, and you can see that 
the total ends are where did the feather meal go? Are, are very close. And then estimated full season pan is within one, one, one page of each other. And then it has how much uh, phosphorus there is for the ones that have phosphorus. Um, this is a, a, a nice way to, to, to look at things. Because if you have, oh, sorry. So let's say your blood meal cost you 20 cents a pound and your feather meal, last time I bought it was 34 cents a pound. You can see that how much the different costs are for the the, the different uh, the different uh, materials. What what the, uh, the one two three the third where it says total end pounds dollars per pound and tells you how many how much dollars you're gonna spend in a pound of uh, each of these. That you can see that the feather meal is more because it costs more. But if you're using if you have phosphorus issues, it, it may be one you may want to use as compared to let's say a chicken manure product. Let's say it runs the same price. And you can see that a pound of N dollars per uh, dry, sorry, sorry, total N for the dollars per pound is quite quite expensive for chicken manure as compared to the uh, fish meal. So sometimes, you know, look, look making that comparison and knowing that difference can make a huge difference in in what you're getting. Are you buying? You actually buying what you're what you're wanting, or you're buying fluff? And then if you go to this here, this this has how much how much you get, and so we got a, a hundred pounds of uh, hundred pounds of blood meal, and it's uh, applied is thirteen pounds of thirteen pounds of N per acre applied. Uh, total at, total dry matter applied be ninety one pounds, and then tells you how much plant available you get from it nine or not full season nine or one. As compared to, let's use. There we go. As compared to uh, to chicken manure, and it provides uh, much, much, much less pan for the uh, same amount of material. So again, it, you can use that to help you figure out how, what how much is available from it, and what's it going to cost me. So it'll help you figure out, you know, or some, sometimes the more expensive fertilizers because it's more concentrated might be a better way to go or vice versa. It just depends on how the, how the, how the cost piece works. And let's come back here to the fertilizer analysis page. We'll go down, whoa. down to the compost and this compost has a total end of about one and a half percent and then is some other compost is 2.2 percent and then you can see over here when you get the full season and that you get much less but you definitely get more from a 2.2 two percent end compost than a one percent compost which is sort of all those calculations go on in the background which is which is the beauty beauty of this you don't have to you don't have to try to do do this yourself Okay, so cover crops and how you deal with cover crops. Okay, so you have these little squares that you go out and uh, and sampling. You have to figure out how, what size they are, and we're going to use a two by a two foot square by a two foot square. So that gives you area sampled would be four square feet. It gives you the fraction of the acre. And then we have the fresh weight of what's in that square. And let's say we have eight, eight pounds. And then we take our sample and send it off to the lab. And it comes back as it's a clover, let's say, that's a vetch. That's what it is, it has 3.5%. And, And then for dry matter, we're going to use 
So you're going to get from the, from this material, you're getting 315 pounds of uh, plant available and from a, a veg crop. So that's doing really, really, really well. It's probably my not, I suspect my fresh weight is a little high. That seems 87,000 is probably closer to more like two pounds and something. Yeah, that's probably closer to, to reality that uh, you're getting more, probably more like two, because 80 pounds from a veg crop is is a more reasonable reasonable number to look at. Um, you can you do this on your own, or there's certainly a number of books out of there that you can get uh, book values for. But the point of this is to use your own values, so it'll help you figure out really what's going on on, on your farm. So I, I recommend you using those. But for a comparison, you can certainly use different. Uh, So you, you take a fresh weight and then you put it in an oven and dry it out and you get a, a dry weight and figure, figure out how much percent solids there are. Something the lab will do, do, do for you. Yeah, 22% solids. Yeah, because that, that, that's basically 78% moisture, which is typical for a, a grass or a vetch or some sort of cover crop. That's, 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 that's a good ball, ball, ballpark value happens to be raining that day, then it's more. Oh, the question was, how do we calculate dry matter? Really? Um, I didn't, the question was, what stage you take it at? Um, you know, it really depends on when you're gonna, you wanna try to do it um, close up to when you're gonna uh, incorporate your, your cover crop. So, you know, it may be, um, Maybe March, maybe April. It just sort of depends on uh, how, how and when, the, the closer you can get to each other, um, the more important it is. Because what happens when cover crops grow, be more so in grains than in legumes, when you start setting seeds, the nitrogen content changes. And you go from uh, a moderate nitrogen content in a grain to a very a much lower uh, and and content in, uh, in, in 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 a grain, so it's important. But you want it reflective of of what of what you're going to try to do. And they you should be able to get pretty good turnaround if you're if you're set up. You sample, get it. You want to send it overnight, get them to dry it, and then get them to analyze. You should be able to get uh, say, uh, analysis within a week. So it'll help you uh, get 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 something going there. Okay. Any other questions about the calculator? No, okay, so we'll go down now. I wanna go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, so. I have a, a few different uh, soil analyses. No problem. I'm not. I'm not used to being tethered. Um, okay, so this was. Uh, Done in the fourth month of the year. So there's a spring sample. It has the organic matter, 3.8. Fairly typical of, uh, of organic matter in Western Washington. Um, nit nitrate nitrogen, which I'm not really concerned about early in the spring because we're still getting flushing to go through. It's 11 parts per million. It really doesn't tell you anything. Phosphorus, weak bray, which is the appropriate test for Western Washington. It also has the Olson test here, but um, that's not the one we would use for Western Washington. 13, so it's low. This field is going to need a little bit of uh, phosphorus. Um, potassium has 99. Again, low, so it's going to need a little bit. Then we come to another number of these, uh, magne um, magnesium and calcium. Um, some of these I worry about more than others. Calcium I worry about a little bit. I've not seen deficiencies in the 917. Generally, if you have a soil that has reasonable pH, you're not gonna have, have much problem with calcium, calcium deficiency there. And sulfur, although it's low, um, it's gonna be okay. 
This doesn't have boron. I usually like to include boron. Boron is frequently uh, deficient in Western Washington, but the difference between a little and a lot is really tight. So you really wanna be really careful if you're gonna apply boron, go very, very easy on it. Um, make sure you have an applicator that really works right and put, put down something lower than you, sort of creep up on how much you think you need, a little bit on this year, a little bit next year. Sometimes if you're deficient in boron, I've seen, I've seen numbers that have, would clearly be deficient in boron, but I see no visible symptoms of boron deficiency. Where other, time, where other times I've had growers, I've worked with a couple of growers, deal with application rates on boron. They have hollow heart and beets, which is a typical boron deficiency. Apply boron, hollow heart and beets go, go away. So it, 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 it can, one of these that sometimes is, is definitely important. The other thing we're looking at here is a pH 6.1, a little bit on the acid side, but certainly in the range that would be fine for, for growing, growing vegetables. Um, but uh, you're going to need to think about putting lime on it at some point in time. Uh, the nice thing about lime is, depending on what form you'll use, you can get calcium and, and, and magnesium from adding lime. And I would, would certainly, for this, if you're going to add lime, I'd, I'd put on one that had magnesium and calcium on it. Yeah. Why is one test necessary for They're just one that's more appropriate for, for predicting phosphorus availability. And it has to do with generally the pH of the soil. Oh, the question was, why are there two tests for phosphorus and which one is more appropriate for Western water? Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Okay. Let's see what else I got down here. It's been a while. Okay, so this is another field. And this is again a spring sample, organic matter, 14.1. That's really high. Can we have that in Western Washington? Absolutely. Don't know anything about this field, so I don't know if that's a correct number or not. That's something that you would need to, to look at, but it is a high value. So, you know, you're gonna get a little more nitrogen from your native organic matter mineralizing from this field. Um, um, nitrogen's low and it's gonna be low that time of the year. Um, phosphorus, a weak ray, 42. So that's a moderate number. It says here it's high, but uh, I, I, I'm used to seeing phosphorus numbers from let's say this low value seen here is about 13 to over 100 parts per million. And over parts per million, you're, you're excessive. You really need to change, change things. In some places, potassium 222, pretty reasonable number. I probably wouldn't worry so much about that. Calcium is about uh, 1,300. So I usually look at about 1,000 for calcium. No boron here. pH 6, not too bad for vegetables, certainly fine for pastures. Um, so it looks outside of the phosphorus, not too bad. Question? Well, the question was, if, you, if I'm not worried about the nitrate, nitrogen in the spring, what's the dynamics on that? Yeah, generally, because you see a lot of flushing that goes on, so it's really high, something funky is going on. Either that or they just applied something and you're getting, you know, they applied a manure of some sort and you're picking up something that's uh, ha ha happening from that application. But also this is a fairly high organic matter soil. High organic matter soils, the nutrient dynamic just in general is funky. It's really, it gets way more difficult to predict from high, high organic matter soils. Well, what I would do for this is I would, this would be a perfect example of when a post harvest nitrate test would be appropriate. Do whatever you're gonna do, what you normally do. Make sure you mark it down so you can figure out what you've done. Then go out and take a post harvest soil test. If it's high, then you need to make some changes. If it's, it's a moderate number, no changes needed, and you just continue on with what, 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 what you're doing. So uh, organic matter, I hear, oh, you don't generally want to go over 10%, seems to be for Western Washington, kind of like the high end of where people recommend going. But up to that point, it seems like you're always pretty much gaining benefit, right? Like the uh, kind of exchange capacity goes up and so on, you lose water holding capacity. But what, like between 10 and 15%, like what is, what is happening that makes it 
problematic. I don't look at it as problematic. I just look at it. It's what it is. You know, you, you know, unless you're in a program to increase carbon, you're not going to, you're not going to increase carbon either by using cover crops regularly or, or compost, something like that. You're going to increase it. Organic matter. I just look at it, what it is. It may go up a little bit. It may go up 1%, but it's not going to go up 20% or 10% or 5% unless you're making huge applications in compost. If you're on, let's say you're a very small grower and you're doing raised beds and you're putting on lots and lots, or even not raised beds, and you're using lots and lots of compost, could you go up to something over 20%? Yes, you certainly can. And it becomes a problem then in keeping plants standing up, the plant corn, the ground's too loose, It'll, a little, little bit of wind comes over and it falls down. So that's the downside of having too much. And, but that only happens, you know, I've seen that in, in uh, raised beds or, or a homeowner situation where they're just applying where a little compost is a, a little, a, a lot is a lot. I've had various people work for me over the years and I say, okay, we're gonna apply compost. We've got some, some demonstration beds we have out there. Put two inches of uh, compost on. I always bring in 20% more compost than I need because it's really hard to spread. And I've had people go out and spread it and say, oh, we, we ran out, we're all done. And they're only halfway through the field, which, which is why I say go easy on a lot. The same thing with the boron. Why you go easy on boron? Because if you over apply boron, you can get in, in big, big troubles just watching how much it is. Okay, so here's another one. This is organic matter 2.1%, not too bad. Phosphorus, uh, again, high. Uh, potassium, moderate, so it's looking okay. I don't worry about it. Calcium is looking good. pH 6.4, so it's looking really good, uh, really good for vegetables. This one has boron 0.1, so it's low. And they say here, you know, avoid, uh, keep above 0.5 ppm. Yeah, you know, you need to, and it says add boron with caution, just the same thing I've said. So I would agree with what, what they have here. People who make recommendations for Western Washington and know that soils are generally deficient and they, you have to go easy on, easy on application. Here's another soil analysis and we have Looks like three different fields. Now these were done in August. So this would be a good time to look at the nitrate because um, this is where during time period you would do a, a, a post-harvest nitrate test. All these are in a moderate range. So not bad uh, management, uh, management of these. 23, 16, oh, sorry, that's the wrong column. Where's the nitrate code? They were here, oh, there you go. 34, a little bit high. 68, very high. Need to change, need to put less on. 16 is not moderate, not, not bad at all. Sorry, that's in the lower portion of these. I was looking at the, the Bray number, the phosphorus numbers. These are all in 2016 and 23. They could certainly use some uh, phosphorus. Uh, what else we have here? pH 5.6, 5.3, 5.8. Definitely could use some lime, um, which will give you this, some mag magnesium at the time and some calcium, which would be fine. These have, oh, the buffer pH. Buffer pH, I've not had any questions on it, but it's used when you have to calculate how much lime do I need to apply to bring my pH up to 7.0, that buffer pH is used in that calculation and there's another extension bolt and out on determining lime, lime application rates. Raising, raising pH. Yeah. Well, they, yeah, the question was about ratio of calcium magnesium. And this is something that we used to have, you used to be in vogue. And it's less so now, we don't look at these ratios quite so much, even though they, they still sort of go on. Um, because generally, if you have a calcium, um, in a re if your pH is in a reasonable range, um, calcium generally isn't a problem, so you're not gonna have this, this, this going on. With this field, where the pH is low, it, poss it, it possibly could, but the real answer is it really needs lime. So that, that's really where you wanna go rather than looking at the ratio. And these borons still low, 0.2, but a little, little higher. And sulfur is 
low to moderate, which was okay. So these are these aren't looking too bad. Okay, so is Nikki here? Oh, okay. Here's our uh, a soil analysis. And what do we have here? This is, uh, do you know anything about this field? Okay. Okay, because it's got lots of phosphorus in it. And potassium, it's uh, moderate, so probably should add some potassium. Um, what's the pH of this soil? pH 6.2. Uh, could use a little bit of lime, and that would take raise your calcium and magnesium up a little bit, which is which is good, because um, six point two is a little low, not not real low. And then down below it has uh, application rates. Uh, oh no, this is uh, nitrate. And was this? This was just taken, so that's a, don't worry about the nitrate. Zinc, magnesium. So yeah, definitely you have phosphorus. Do you have chickens? Okay, that 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 that, that, that explains then why the phosphorus is so high. There's usually a telltale sign for phosphorus being too high. A uh, number of the pieces of ground that I work on at the experiment station, we used to have chickens. I have phosphorus values that are embarrassingly high. I have a plot that we put in about the second year I was here. And we've not put any phosphorus on it left yet. And I'm still over 100 parts per million. Yeah, well, it's just, it's just, 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 just what phosphorus is. That's why we, we look at it, at it. Because it's the same thing you'll find frequently if you going on to an old dairy site and they've uh, applied lots and lots of manure, you're going to get a lot of nitrogen for doing nothing. Because it's just you've increased that background amount of, of uh, organic matter and it just keeps keeps releasing. Well, yeah, there's there's some personal opinion about how how much you sort of need and. Um, university folks are a little more conservative than other folks. It depends on sort of your how intensively you're managing things. So it's 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 you know if you put four soil scientists in a room and ask them to analyze these, you're going to get eight different uh, opinions of what ought to be done. So so it, it is you know the more what you want to do is find a lab that you like works for you and stick with them. Uh, phosphorus? Okay. I don't know, nothing that I've heard of. But what you do get with phosphorus, phosphorus is unique, that even if you have a lot of phosphorus in it, a deficiency of phosphorus in a plant is sort of a reddish color in the leaves. And I have fields that I know of excess of 100 parts per million in the first foot of phosphorus, and I still get reddish, reddish leaves in the spring. And it'd be, but I know it's not a phosphorus deficiency. So you can still you can still sort of get things. Yeah, it depends what your pH is. If you have a really acid soil, then you you know you you want to be thinking about what what you need to do do to solve the pH issue. Because certainly a lot of the micronutrients also become as some get more available, some get less available as you become more acid. Any other questions? And then this is what was recommended to go on there. And this is a 30 pounds of, and this, this per thousand square feet. So I don't know what these numbers mean. I'd have to sit down and do, do the math to get them from 
thousand square feet back to pounds, pounds, pounds per acre. Um, there's actually the calculator spreadsheet. There's a version of that that does thousand square feet. There's two versions, one that does pounds per acre, one that does uh, garden size square, square feet. Some people say, you know, depending if you only have five acres, thousand square feet works from. If you're in the golf, golf turf industry, they think thousand square feet. I'm, 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 I come from the ag world, so I think pounds per acre. That's the, that's the last one I have. So I have lots of time for questions, I think. Oh, seven. Well, maybe a few minutes for questions, but I have enough time for questions. I don't, I don't generally don't. The question was, if you have a sandy soil or a clay soil, is there some indication that you should look at the soil test and, and change something? Yeah. I don't, I generally don't know. Yeah. No, yeah. If you're pasture folks, we do have a brand new pasture extension Bolton that I didn't, I don't have a copy. Oh, good. It, and it'll, it, it's brand new and it goes through fertilizing pastures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually when you take a soil, I'll, I'll knock off the top so you're down to soil. Because you could, depending on what what grass you have, how old it is, how, how it's been grown, you might have quite a bit of thatch on there, which is not really, it's not soil, it's thatch, it's plant, it's plant, it's not plant roots, it's sort of plant stems, but it's not, it's not part of soil. So it's sort of like, generally when I go soil sampling, I'll, I'll have a probe and I'll, I'll usually just kick off the top of the soil with my foot, with pasture, I do something a little more aggressive, or I wait till I pull the core out and then pull the top off of it. And so Amy's here and Allison's here. Do you guys have soil probes to the lend? Yep. Okay. Okay. And that and that is depending on what county you're in will depend on what uh, what the county can do for you and who has uh, probes to. To, to borrow. But it's a whole lot easier soil sampling if you have a, a real soil probe than using a shovel. Are there any questions from afar? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, any. I would do depending on how you manage, what's your management unit that you're going for. So if you can man if you manage those separately, I would sample them separately. If you sample them together, I would sample them together. My recommendation, if you have something that cows never see, is it cows or sheep? Both, okay. If you have a field that animals never see, that's gonna be different. So if it's large enough that you can actually manage it differently, then you'd wanna sample it differently. Yes, six like two six acre fields. Yeah, I something that size, I'd I'd manage them differently. Okay, so yeah, I wanted to pull up a, a website here if we can, maybe we can do this. Okay, so here is my website. And there was a question earlier about soils and soil types. So I'm just going over soils and soil testing labs. And we have all sorts of good stuff on here. 
childhood. Uh, where is it? No, I'm looking for NRCS side of soil textures and everything. I have it on here. Let's be patient. We'll... No, that's Craig's. Uh... It's your, yeah. I have a link. Oh, here it is. There it is. So we want this one here. We want this one. There you go. Yeah. And then you go to where? Washington. And then you got to find Pierce County. Okay, so here's uh, here's Pierce County, and you have uh, various ones to choose. We're going to do the current one, and then you just go to this site, and if you have your address, you can type and put your address in here. This will then, if you go further, I'm not gonna go through it in there, but this is this is the experiment station. And if you go up here and you choose soil map. What's this? Oh, I do an A, that's right, I gotta do a area first. So you gotta designate an area like that. There we go. And then we can go to soil map. And then this tells you what kind of soil, it just gives you the map of what kind of soil is in there. And if you click on these, you get more info. You get everything you ever want to know about soils from, from, from these, not nutrient wise, but just sort of geologically standard. It does it make good building material, does it make good farming material, what can you grow on and all sorts of stuff. So this is, these are mainly alder words, Nupland soil, Briscott loam and uh, Everett, early sandy loams are lowland river valley style soils so this is a really a, a cool site if you're looking for, if you're looking to buy something or if you just want to know more about soils this is a cool site as more and these replaced books we used to have a book for every county and uh when i first moved to puyallup i had you have to give away i used to have three kids i had to give away my firstborn to, to get a copy of the soil survey because they weren't making them anymore but uh, now they've got these up online and i've not used my soil my paper soil survey book in, I don't know why I still have it on my shelf. Yeah, it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't work. Is it working today? Okay, because yes, I, I love that. You want you want to go out and influence people? There's a site, they have this online for when it works. It hasn't worked in probably six months or better. Um, you can basically have your phone. It tells you where you are. It tells you what kind of soil you're standing on and what it is. It's really It's really great. It's really a cool, cool thing. I'm very disappointed that uh, that it's not working. It's not working in general. I think they're I think they're needing money. Keeping up web locations for that kind is expensive. Yeah, you know, there's just it takes a lot of upkeep to keep them going because every time, every time they change a the version, you got to change your web page. So it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of money involved in changing things. But it's a cool, both of those are very cool. Question? Yeah. 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 
helpful for you. What if you're somebody who wants to make sure you have enough nitrogen in the soil for that year's crop that you're going to harvest in midsummer? What's kind of like the earliest time of year you can take a soil test and a nitrate number is going to be helpful? Sort of a, a mid-season number. That's why I talked about that mid-season test. Is usually it's it was formed for corn, which they call a pre-side dress nitrate test. So it's as late as you can get through and still cultivate the corn. But if you look at those numbers, that's that's sort of that, that time of the year. You know, once once the rains have started, stopped. So the question was, uh, when would be the most appropriate time to take a mid-season soil test for determining nutrient uh, sufficiency? Yeah, getting to know your soils and have a history to know what, what went on and knowing that once you get past that first year, it helps you figure out where 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 you are and things you know you have a soil. Especially if you have when you're sand soil sampling, I didn't talk about soil sampling today, but when you're soil sampling, you should go out and sample units that are uniform. If you have a six acre field and you have this little piece that's one acre, that's an old house site, it doesn't grow very well, it's never grown very well, you don't really care about it because you can't do anything to make it produce. Don't sample that site because it's gonna it's gonna impinge on that on 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 the, the field that you have a soil sample that's not indicative of what you're doing. So getting getting a soil sample that's indicative of what you want to do is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you want to pick things that are higher in nitrogen for the spring. The question was, what samples, what fertilizers might have more available and in the spring with cool temperatures? Just in general, you're going to have more trouble in the spring getting nitrogen availability. But you may want to apply a little bit extra in the spring to get so you have a little bit more in the system, knowing that it's going to be a little, a little, a little cooler. But choose things that are high that I have a high end concentration because they're going to be more available, or 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 have more ammonium in them. Okay. Question is: Can soil temperature be used as a guide for soil testing? Um, Oh, sorry, mid-season testing. It's not one that I do. I look more at stage of growth than, uh, than a, a temperature. Um, yes, you, well, it depends. Question was, I'm sorry, <laughs> you want to shake your head. Question was, what do we do with compost and how do you test it? When do you test it? Can you use some of the other's analysis? How much variability is there in compost? There is lots of variability in compost. There are no two composts that are the same. I have made lots of compost and none of the composts I made are the same and I could never predict what the end concentration is. But having given and said that, um, if you're concerned about costs, then you need to be able to predict what the what the end concentration or C to N ratio is of of of, of the compost. Um, and I know this is going to change depending on how dynamic your compost uh, feedstock pieces are. So it could change quite a little bit. I know that for a number of years we used no fish carcasses in our some compost we were making. And we started adding fish car carcasses, and this changed the C to N ratio greatly. I'm just adding fish car carcasses, so I highly recommend testing. Any other any last questions? Okay. Sure. Yeah. 
compost and compost has their own set of uh, uh, test parameters and they need to do, you need to go to a lab that te regularly tests compost and they'll know how to test them. And there's a, there's a, there's a extension bulletin on testing of compost on my website. No, we're our offices. Oh, you're. I have. I have. 